Hi, happy Friday. Welcome to the 12th House Podcast, where we explore the intersection of wellness, well-being, intuition, spirituality, intuitive business, and being a person. Welcome. <sighs> We're excited to have you. It's hard to be a human. Welcome. God, Happy God Friday. <laughs> yeah. Stop out there. Well, how you doing? I'm good because in my future projection, it's Friday. <laughs> there you go. Way to be positive. Love that. There you go. I'm, I'm already feeling the Friday feeling as we're recording this. I'm going to channel it. Yeah, it's great. Cool. Well, let's get into today's wellness and well-being news. We have a lot of, a lot of of things that we're thinking about this week. I think I want to start with the Americans are drinking too much because, uh, wow. What kinds of things as I have (laughs) three (laughs) double fists. (laughs) Bridges that I'm going between. Honestly, I I have three as well, but none are alcoholic. So I I flagged this article, it was in the Atlantic, called Drinking Too Much is an American problem. America has a drinking problem because Mm -hmm. we covered sober curious living and non-alcoholic beverages in the cusp a couple months ago. And I fell deeply into the rabbit hole while researching on Mm -hmm. sober curious and non-alcoholic cocktails and all the things. And all the statistics I were reading were insane about people who had stopped drinking and just how millennials and Gen Z really have, are like teetotalers in comparison to Gen X and I don't know, the people older than us, boomers. But then this article came out in the Atlantic and it's talking about how Americans, the number of alcohol related deaths in the United States in the last 20 years has doubled Alcohol is one of the leading drivers of the decline of American life expectancy, and those numbers are expected to get worse because, like, things like the sales of hard liquor went up significantly during the pandemic. And in the last year, Americans, a quarter of Americans said that they drunk more over the past year as a means of coping with stress. Mm -hmm. And it's very surprising because in this article, it, it says that, you know, it's, defying expectations what's happening because we have on the one end so many people who are obsessed with wellness and who are sober curious it mentions the sober curious movement focusing on being well and on the other end we have this rise in alcoholism and things like you know chugging or throwing back trulies and (laughs) white claws and rosé all the time and how that has really been exacerbated by pandemic stress. Yeah, it's so interesting to think about the pendulum swinging also just in that direction of drinking more to cope with stress during the pandemic. And then those, myself included, who didn't drink a lot at all during the pandemic. And then as soon as I was vaccinated, like went on a tear. (laughs) And last weekend, I was like, I think my depression is worse because I've been drinking so much. There's definitely a correlation. And especially with you know, the summer and, and things opening back up, I can see it swinging even further in the direction of even people who weren't drinking and who are like, I feel great not drinking. It's the kind of social pressures, the social anxiety, also just wanting to connect with people and how much of our socializing is still centered around heavy drinking, usually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's very within the culture, which I thought was interesting about the headline of the article it's an American problem. I wonder what the stats are in European countries where drinking is very much part of the lifestyle, but the relationship to it is very different. Yeah. I remember when I was doing research for our sober curious white paper in the cusp and non-alcoholic beverage paper, another surprising statistic to me was that Japan also has a binge drinking problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just didn't expect that, but the more I read about it, the more it made sense, you know, brands like Sapporo and Kirin who are also making non-alcoholic beverages. Like they're doing so well because people have to drink there. I think they call the day that they don't drink a liver reset or a liver cleanse Mm -hmm. day. And 
that was really fascinating. But I think you're right. Like binge drinking feels like a newer phenomenon. I remember when we were in college, I'm 32. It was like a big thing that kids were binge drinking. And I remember like Googling it and being like, oh yeah, yeah, I guess that we are binge drinking. If that's what the definition of binge drinking is. Yep. That hits. But I wonder if college kids now still drink as much as I don't know. We did in college. Do you go and do six, seven shots? I can't even think about that now. Oh I think people do. I don't know. I, yeah. I'm on TikTok as an old person. And mm-hmm. I feel like I see kids who are throwing back seven or eight white claws and shots and just, I don't know. White claws are malt liquor. It's not just like water with alcohol in it. <laughs> it's so crazy to me. Obviously, we like drinking because it's fun and because it connects us. But I think that just in general, extreme behavior, whether it's extreme reaction, reactivity, or extreme emotions has been amplified by our culture. You know, we have social media that sort of pushes us from the middle, from the nuance to the extremes, to the biggest, like the sort of most dissonant sides. And I think that that's kind of what we are trained to react to now, or like extreme flavors, extreme feelings, extreme entertainment. And I think it's affecting us and impacting us in a lot of ways that we're going to continue to see. This is making me think of the article I was reading in the New York Times, which is about Wobot, and it's written by Karen Brown. It's a really great article about the state of mental health in the U.S. right now. Four in 10 adults have reported that they have symptoms of anxiety or depression this year. I mean, like, no shit. Right? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you guys that's not surprising. <laughs> exactly. What's interesting is we've been noticing as we do research for the cusp and figure out what we're going to test, there is such an explosion of telehealth therapy, but also AI-specific therapy Mm -hmm. and bots. So Wobot is what this article is talking about, just raised $22 million in venture capital. And it's seeking to get approval from the FDA to be able to treat postpartum depression and adolescent depression, and then be able to sell this to health systems at scale. So on the one hand, this is really scary. (laughs) Like when I was reading it at first, I was like, this is terrifying because they don't have to think about the cost of labor. This is replacing therapists because a Wobot can have multiple back-to-back sessions, is available 24 hours. No human being can replace that kind of access. And there's a, a lot of other things that come along with the data privacy issues. They don't really touch on that yet in this article, but that's a whole other topic. So at first I was reading and I was feeling a little negative about it, but then towards the end, I think they make some good arguments for how AI therapy bot serves a different purpose than a therapist. There are some positives to being able to have access to an AI therapy app when you can't speak to your therapist. So it's kind of like, is this an adjunct therapeutic service that's just going to become normal for us and really accessible? Yeah. I mean, like, I think the obvious good is that it makes this stuff way more affordable. So we were just talking about how like we pay out of pocket for, I couldn't afford seeing a therapist until I turned 30 because I just didn't have the money to spend. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I should have been seeing a therapist since I was like 16 years old. Right. Are you sure everybody? Exactly. Like there was just an article in the New York times last week about how should you go to therapy or not? And the article was like, pretty much everyone should go to therapy. Everyone can benefit from therapy, which is wild. And I think that obviously the big takeaway I'm seeing is that we're seeing so much more conversation about mental well-being and mental health and normalizing these conversations that have been stigmatized for so long. But then we are looking at things like AI robots that are going to try and replace therapists who go to years of school and have empathy and are looking and learning and listening and creating relationships to us. Is that the right direction that we want to go in? Do we really need to like, I don't know, take the humanity out of this very human empathic and, you know, experience that I just, One of the doctors quoted in this article is like, we're trying to create this 
illusion of intimacy without the demands of an actual relationship. Okay, so, so you that make a bond. Like <laughs> yeah, you make a bond with something that doesn't even know that it's bonding with you. Okay, so like that sounds like a like abusive it's her. relationship or just well, like that sounds is so it not bad. the movie yes, her, her exactly. actualized just feels like this is not the point. Like we are missing the forest for the trees. I feel like all of this is symptomatic of a deeper issue. And in this article, they talked about how there's a dearth of therapists right now. There's a critical shortage of therapists and psychiatrists in the United States and people need therapy. And I think part of that is because number one, it's so expensive to go to secondary or postgraduate school. And also because so many people instead of going to school and going into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt to become a psychiatrist or a therapist and to have this like very Western way of like correctly therapizing someone or helping someone. So many people are instead opting to become coaches to either become health coaches or anxiety coaches or life coaches. And while that system is so not regulated, there are some amazing coaches out there. There are some horrible coaches out there, just as there are with therapists and psychiatrists. I think that that's going to throw a wrench into things. I, I do think that the, the coaching industry is only going to grow over the next decade or so. It's really like yeah, hit its because of COVID, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest takeaway here is that, yes, mental health is getting in the limelight. Finally, it's getting tech funding. It's getting in the press. Like we're talking about it. But our mental health experience, especially in the United States, is very piecemeal and very disembodied. It's not holistic at all. And mental illness and COVID have both exposed just how broken the American healthcare system really is. And these private companies are coming in trying to sort of be the connective tissue, but really this whole system is diseased. Like it needs to be fixed from the inside out. And these privatized solutions really just kind of prioritize profit over social impact. And that can get scary really fast. I think you're seeing it on the tech side, you're seeing it in the media, and it's nice to see that it's becoming less stigmatized. It's now just about incorporating all of these services into our actual healthcare system, not at all being privatized. Yeah, and I would argue that like, yes, of course, for sure, we're seeing more people talk about it, but it's there's still a huge stigma. I mean, Naomi Osaka basically dropped right. out of the French Open this week because she was getting penalized for talking about her mental health. And mm. the situation is fucked up. I feel like it is the like perfect example of the intersection of misogyny, sexism, racism, like all of the things. And basically, if you don't know, Naomi Osaka is an incredible tennis player. She was scheduled to play in the French Open, I think, this week. And they have to do this series of interviews. All of the athletes, it's press. It's mandatory that they have to do before the event, part of their contract. And I don't know if anyone watches sports. I'm not really a sports person, but I think that if you're familiar with Serena Williams and probably seen interviews where the press just attack athletes and they try to get a rise out of them. It's for entertainment, right? It's for clicks. It's to get them to say something that they can put some crazy headline on top of. So more people will click on it. And of course, look at more traffic. And it's very dysregulating. Athletes talk about all the time how it gives them anxiety and it throws them off their game. And so much of being an athlete, especially a high performing athlete, is about your mental toughness and how well you can keep calm under pressure. And Naomi Osaka said, you know, doing these press events, sitting through these conversations with people that I don't want to talk to before I'm supposed to perform is not good for my mental health and it's not good for my game. So I'm not going to do it. And I'll take the fine. They usually find them because it's like drop in the bucket for them. They wouldn't allow her to, I think. So she said, I'm just going to drop them. I'm not going to participate in the French Deuces. Open. Yeah. It's not surprise. It's unfortunate and horrible. And we're like, not surprised. Think about how Serena has been treated mm -hmm. not only within the world of tennis for different outfits that she's been wearing because yeah. she's needed to for her health or yeah. even how she was treated throughout her pregnancy. Yeah, it's this combination of misogyny, lack of care for women's health, whether it's mental or reproductive, and definitely racism. 
Totally. And we have really normalized the abuse of high performers in these industries, like whether it's football or like the Olympics and Olympians or tennis. Or even uh, celebrity, though. When Harry and Meghan had that conversation with Oprah, I had a lot of people saying to me, well, what did she expect? you know, being part of the royal family. That's not that's not the place that we should be operating from, but Right. I think it's normal to like have just to be like, yeah, there might be some blowback if you're in the limelight. But Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you should just take abuse or that you should roll over and be like, Well, I guess I signed up for this because I'm really good at what I do and one of the greatest athletes in the world. And so I just need to take abuse as part of my job that is so backwards and fucked up and I don't know we we could probably dive into how problematic things like football are especially for people of color and how many people will say that football American football is just basically like the modernization of slavery and how we're sort of capitalizing on the abuse of physical bodies of people of color and yes we're paying them money but we also like we don't really give them another, a lot of other options to be successful. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that same thing is happening here. Like as soon as someone, as a woman of color begins to advocate for herself and her well being and what she needs, she's penalized and punished because she's not falling in, in line. And it seems just so contradictory of what we see in athletics, which is, you know, athletes spend so much time and energy and money on their mindset and their bodies. And, For the French Open to penalize Naomi for saying, this is what I need to do in order to play the game. I need to take care of my mental health. Seems like it's abundantly clear that this isn't about athletes. It's about money and press. Bottom line, maybe. Anyway, destroy capitalism. So, (laughs) but I I am, I'm inspired by people taking back personal sovereignty and like owning their Mm -hmm. stories and hopefully are these systems that have been created that make it feel like it's nearly impossible for us to own our stories about our mental health or like we're sort of pushing back and against them and they're crumbling. Yeah, not too far off from taking back sovereignty. When we were talking about Stig IPO, the modern scrub wear company. <laughs> Scrubs are like medical yeah. apparel for mm-hmm. nurses, doctors. They've been doing really well for a while. And basically this industry is like, you could get scrubs out of the vending machine at the hospital, right? If you're a doctor or whatever, like maybe if you're a dental hygienist or a nurse, you like buy some cute scrubs, but they were boxy and ugly and not comfortable and bit built for men, right? They were just like feminized mm-hmm. by making them pink or putting like a cute print on them. And Figs really said, but became, not like, the right cut. Like, no, come on, no. we need a different cut. Where Figs is the to me is like the Lululemon of scrubs. Mm-hmm. You know, it's right, like, right. these are cute you look kind of hot but appropriate and that's yeah they've done really really well it's a female founded company and they were the first female founded company to IPO which is kind of wild it's huge it's wild also the founders are super young they're like I think they're our age which well yeah (laughs) you go girl (laughs) go get it not not for me but you go get it that sounds awesome but I mean it just points out like when we get women or people who experience marginalization or traditionally haven't been centered when we get them in places where their voices and experiences can be centered amazing things can happen amazing things can be unlocked let's just address the elephant in the room Wallace yes (laughs) that Finally, I can go to my astrophysics scientist, rocket scientist brother and be like, UFOs are real. <laughs> Let's talk about it. The CIA is going to release everything about UFOs at some point this month. Some very sneaky conspiracy theorist slash one of us worked into a bill about COVID that there needs to be a release around all information that we know about UFOs from the government. And so that bill was passed or that legislation was passed and like sort of as like a tack on with with like much bigger things that had to do with COVID. We get this like little thing coming out of it, which is actually kind of a big thing and, and really cool. I mean, for the last couple of years, we've heard about some declassified information about UFOs and Actually, there's this really cool paper I found on the Akashic Records and how the CIA has been has used the Akashic Records to find information. What? I need to yes. 
Yeah, it's crazy, which is just so cool. And now we're waiting to read more, but it seems like, yeah, UFOs are definitely real. The report that they have mm-hmm. six weeks to release must contain detailed analyses of UFO data and intelligence collected by the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, and the FBI. Love, Love to see that interdepartment sort of like collaboration and synergy. Yeah. I just want to know <laughs> what HBO special is going to come out when we're like 50 of all the things they tr- they covered up and didn't release during this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just want to know. I'm so skeptical. I think it's cool. I'm I'm interested to see how this potentially opens up the rest of the world to other fringe beliefs like, I don't know, spirituality and mysticism, perhaps, witchcraft, wizardry, ghosts, tarot. I mean, if aliens and it can exist and the Akashic Records exist, why can't all those other things? Okay, I think that's it. That's all we have for today. Really, that was a roller coaster of emotions that we went on. I was angry. I was emotional. I was thinking about my mental health. I was thinking about how I'm not drinking anymore. And finally landing on aliens. And maybe they can help us with our mental health. (laughs) Please. Please. (laughs) We'll take anything at this point. (laughs) (laughs) We need all the help. (laughs) Interplanetary intervention. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's all of our news. If you have some hot tips for us, go ahead and send them in to our text line. We'd love to hear from you. And we're actually going to give you a sneak peek of a class that I taught inside of the North Node called Becoming a Spellcasting CFO. It's not actually how to become a chief financial officer of a giant corporation, but in it, we do talk about money and magic and the energetics, for lack of a better term, around finances in your intuitive business. So I'm going to give you a little sneak peek. The whole class is actually two hours long, and it's inside of the North Node, which is our private members community for intuitive entrepreneurs. And the door is open to North Node on June 20th, which is so soon. So if you want to be the first to be notified when it goes live, then go ahead and submit your name to be on the wait list, the VIP list, and we'll make sure that you get pinged as soon as the doors open. And this is the last time we're opening the doors in a big way, sort of like welcoming one final class, and then North Node will be sort of closed. We're at capacity. So if you want to join, if you've been thinking about it, now's the time. Do it. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) It's a good time. It's the, the best group of people ever. Not biased. Just telling the truth. So today we are talking about spell crafting CFO, money magic. It's going to be really fun. And if this is your first North Node Masterclass, welcome. We're going to talk about a lot today. And there's also going to be a ton that we don't talk about in terms of money because money is like and wealth and your relationship to money is ever changing and it is expansive, like I said. Also, everything that I'm going to share with you today is from my personal experience, I'm not an accountant. I am not a financial planner. I am a person who runs a business, who bootstrapped a business. I'm a woman who's bootstrapped a business and who's worked with multiple startups and who's worked with lots of small businesses before. So that's my expertise. If you want way more of a deep dive into things like a profit and loss sheet or statement, how to figure out what your profit margins are, all that good stuff, I recommend working with a bookkeeper and accountant to figure out what those numbers look like and are best for you and your business because every business is different and every person is different. What could be an amazing salary to me might be small potatoes to you. We're all different and that's wonderful and great. So the information I'm going to give you today, take the stuff that you like, leave the stuff that you don't. I would say that anything that feels and particularly dysregulating, meaning it gives you a strong emotional reaction one way or another, either it super lights you up or to use a popular word triggers you, right? Like really catalyzes you. I would put a pin in that and just note it. And you don't have to like walk away at the end of this class completely having metabolized all this information or even agreeing with all this information. That's not the point. Really, my goal is to show you some new perspectives and some new information, and then you can decide what you want to do with that. We're going to talk about embracing breathless excitement. (laughs) It's exciting. Then we're going to talk about uncluttering your unconscious. 
And we're going to talk about money's vibe, the vibe of money. We're going to talk about money patterns. So I'm going to need you to take your personal skepticals out and start to locate yourself. It's going to be fun and also a little intimidating, but mostly fun, I promise. And then we're going to talk about real life money magic. So hold on to your butts. Okay, so first and foremost, Money brings up feelings. You probably are already having a ton of big feelings, just like hearing me talk about things like profit and loss sheets and accountants and money and salaries and dysregulation, right? And it can bring up so, so, so much in us and our emotions can sort of ping pong all over the place from anger to resentment to fear to anxiety to shame. So let's just take a deep breath in and let it out. And one more deep breath in, in case you didn't do the first one with me. Deep breath in. And exhale it out. Okay. Nothing wrong with these feelings, right? And I don't think that we need them right now. So let's just put them on pause for the next hour and a half. We can we can use them later. Like, trust me, at 5 p.m., you can unpack those guys. That's totally fine. But for the next 90 minutes, let's try to just push, say, like, come back later to this. And let's tackle a couple of things that hold us back from wealth, which are shame, right? Which comes up, especially for uh, people who hold a, a female identity, I should say. Shame comes up, accommodating. So trying to make sure that everyone else's needs are met before us or putting our needs second, our emotions, our feelings second, and prioritizing the needs of others first at expense of ourselves caretaking, which is sort of the same as accommodating, and also superstition, right? We'll talk about some common superstitions that come up with wealth and money in particular and visioning our future. I know for me, at times of my life, I've been all of the above. In the last year, I've been all of the above. In the last week, actually, in the last week, I totally accommodated my partner by, by hiding how well I was, ma- I was doing this week because I didn't want to make him feel bad. Right. So these things come up constantly. And just because we work on a relationship with money doesn't necessarily mean that they go away forever. It just means that we can just like shadow, we can notice when they come up. And instead of letting them drive our ship, right, or steer the ship, we say, okay, thank you. I'm actually going to take control of the situation now. And you can choose whether you want to pull that into your relationship and the, the way that you act in the world. Let's try to just address our shame and notice when it comes up and, and let it go, right? To move past it, not bypass it, but just feel into it. Let's try not to accommodate each other or the feelings of others, right? Let's try not to take care of other people who haven't asked us to. And let's try to just notice our superstitions or dysregulation around actions or rituals with money just in the next 90 minutes. Have you ever said something like this? If I say, if I say, or you thought this, if I say it out loud, it won't come true or happening already. But if I say it out loud, I'm going to jinx it. I say that all the time. I'm like, oh, things are going so well. I mean, I don't want to jinx it. What? That's fucking dumb. We, where did we learn that? Like, especially as women, I feel like we learned it when we blow out birthday candles on a cake, right? Don't tell anyone your wish, what you wish for, for your birthday, or else it won't come true. Or like, I don't know, in fairy tales, right? We can't, uh, I feel like Cinderella, she says that. That's why I put this fairy godmother. She says, like, I can't say my wish out loud or else it won't come true. And that's really old programming, right? Or maybe unconscious programming, a great example of unconscious programming that potentially comes up for us around money and the goals that we have or the vision that we have, right? Oh, I have to keep my wish secret, my wish for a million dollar house, or I don't know, something cool that you want, some desire that you have to go on to take like three months off of work and just travel. For me, I'm like, I just want to take like a year long maternity leave and not work. That's like my goal. But man, do you know how many people would, how many times I haven't said that out loud because I don't want people to judge me or I'm scared that like, well, if I say that, then maybe I'll never be able to get pregnant. (laughs) Like that's legit insane. But all of these unconscious programs have been running in the background for so long. And I know you all know about the unconscious or subconscious versus conscious mind. And I just want to point out that this is a really common one, especially for people that hold a feminine identity, to not say what we want out loud for fear that it won't come true, fear that it will look stupid, or fear that we'll be ashamed 
like that people will shame us for what we want. So that being said, I want to ask you, what are you really proud of right now? And I want you to say that without any shame around it. I want you to say what you're proud of without caretaking for anyone else, without worrying about making anyone else feel bad. I want to celebrate your success and for you to own your success. What are you really proud of right now? It couldn't be anything. All right. Whew. Okay. You did so good. So that was the first thing. The first thing was embracing breathless excitement. Have you heard of Gestalt therapy? Correct me if I completely butcher, but Fritz Perls developed Gestalt therapy, which is a type of therapy. And just by developing this type of therapy, he recognized that fear is essentially just sort of a breathless excitement. So if you think about the last time you were scared, what that feeling was inside your body, right? That electric feeling, which you know, when we actually add a breath in to our, to that feeling of like, ooh, getting charged up, we can transmute fear into something really cool and also something really powerful because fear is really a very powerful emotion, right? So if we can uh, step out of just the fear aspect, we can transmute it into something that's potentially useful to us. Maybe that's excitement that gets us ready to go or get it gets us into momentum or like sexual turn on like um, erotic excitement, right? That all of a sudden the, a negative emotion or an emotion that we have a negative connotation with maybe fear or anxiety or resentment or anger, we can transmute into a feeling that's more positive. And we recognize that maybe these feelings are more, more similar than dissimilar, right? They're so close to each other. And all we have to do is cross the threshold from one into the other. So we are going to have moments of breathless excitement today. Maybe sharing what you were excited, what you were proud of was a moment where you're like, ah! I hope no one judges me for this thing that I said. I hope people think I look good. I hope people like uh, this is appropriate. All these, maybe these things that come up in my mind all the time. Maybe we can embrace that breathless excitement by adding a breath in. So anytime you feel like you're losing your breath today, I want you to just remember, or you feel that fear come up, remember to breathe. That is the, one of the biggest ways we can transmute that I mean, emotion that we have a negative connotation with, right? So another thing to point out is that we as humans get really used to this feeling of fear, right? Or um, how much energy and how charged that feeling is, right? Or even anxiety. It makes us feel alive. It reminds us that we're alive, right? Because we are feeling like a massive emotion. And that means that sometimes we create needless obstacles and drama in our lives when things are going too well. We want to feel something, right? We almost can't trust that we can exist without that feeling of fear, without that feeling of anxiety. Can anyone resonate with maybe creating that in their life or perpetuating fear or Sometimes we call this self-sabotage. <laughs> Sometimes we always fucking call this self-sabotage. Can anyone resonate with that? If we recall the archetypes, we know that the saboteur archetype is a core archetype that we all have. All humans have this archetype, right? It's one of our four survival archetypes. The saboteur is like, are you sure you want to change that thing? Because we're doing fine over here. We're alive. <laughs> and like, if you change that thing, we might die. I don't know. Just putting it out there, right? The saboteur wants things to stay the same. <laughs> stay comfy. And while that is totally relatable, right? Like if things, I know this life, I know this reality, if I change it, there's so many potentials out there that I don't know yet. And at least this is the, the evil that I know, right? And out there beyond me, there's potentially places and things and opportunities that I don't know and understand. And that could be much worse. But also that could be so, 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 so much better. So when we notice the saboteur archetype pop up in our lives, that's a really good place for us to note that we are about to change, right? That we're stepping into a threshold a threshold moment, a liminal space where we're evolving and changing and usually up leveling. So notice that that's just something to put in your journal, maybe of like self-sabotage and this feeling of anxiety, right? We might actually want to transmute it from fear and self-sabotage into excitement and momentum. I'll tell a story. My mom is 
seconds. So it's almost like we have this energy and we need to fill it up, right? We need to like put it somewhere and we can either transmute it and put it somewhere potentially useful or we can let it, you know, fester in our lives. (laughs) So what, what's the point of this? Why am I bringing it up? This is an example of an unconscious belief that's cluttering your sub- unconscious or subconscious around money and safety, right? And we've got to be conscious around wealth and money and how, we, how we're resourced. We have to. Because if we're not, like, we'll keep perpetuating these things in our lives, right? Our shadow will be the thing that runs us instead of us having choice and free will in how we act and interact with the world. And we're not going to just become cool with money on accident, right? It's not just like we wake up one day and we're like, great, I did it. I'm all of a sudden great with money. Like, um, I'm so glad that I just kept pulling tarot cards all day because that really was the ticket. No, that's not true. Like, I wish it was true. I totally wish it was true. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? All I had to do was pull tarot cards all day. Now, tarot can certainly help you explore your relationship to money and wealth, but we have to do some conscious excavation of what our unconscious beliefs are. And this is shadow work, right? And how we relate to the parts of ourselves that we've hidden away for a really long time because we deem them as unlovable and we repress them because we think that we can't be, we can't be hugged from society if we, if we contain these ideals or we contain these aspects of ourselves and the truth it couldn't be farther from the truth we need to embrace or at least acknowledge these aspects of ourselves in order to be whole and in order to have a healthy relationship with the world around us including money so interesting thing that i feel like all of you might want to just like tweet the modern english word for wealth actually comes from the middle english term well which means well-being and health So when I say wealth today, and even when I talk about money and our relationship to money, I want you to remember this origin, right, where this word comes from. So interesting that wealth really has nothing to do with accumulation, right, or luxury or opulence. Wealth in its original, you know, where the word, where it originates from really is about our well-being and like living, right, because that's what health is. So we're not just here to make money. Like also that's not what businesses are. Businesses are not just around to make money. They're not. They make money. Like that's an important part of being a business. But the reason that you have a business or the reason that you like exist is to make a difference, right? Businesses come here to change things or to evolve things or to make things better for somebody, maybe selfishly, but hopefully most of the time it's for all of us, right? And money is a tool that helps us accomplish our purpose. So it's not separate from our purpose and it isn't our sole purpose. I'm so small right now. It's not our sole purpose. It is a tool that helps us accomplish our purpose. And so you, if you think of yourself as a business, you need money to help you accomplish your purpose. Now, we need lots of other tools in order to accomplish our purpose alongside money. Trust me, if we only throw money at the problem, we won't have anything. If we don't have talent and innovation and intuition and skills, actual skills, right, then we're not going to get much done with just money. But money is really important to getting things done. So like, period, end the story, which is why we're talking about it. And wealth is so much more than money. So today we're going to talk about the three aspects of wealth and what we need to understand or how we need to develop our relationship to wealth. Obviously, our relation to money contributes to our well-being, obviously. And obviously, the definition of wealth is well-being and health. So uh, these things are intrinsically linked and we can't ignore them. And money contributes to our well-being, like period. It does, for, for better or for worse. So we have to address it. If we truly want to be well, if we truly want to be healthy, we need to look at our relationship to money. So we're going to look at our unconscious beliefs, our conscious patterns, and then our physical practices. That's what we're talking about today in terms of wealth and in terms of money. We want to unclutter our money habits and our patterns to save our energy. Remember how I was telling you about my mom and how she just is like spending all this energy on her anxiety and just like moving it from one space to another space. What we want to do, we are limited in our capacity, right? Has, like, has anyone read Essentialism? Pop into the chat with like an emoji. Me, it's like me. I read it. Yes. 
Like we have a limited amount of energy, right? We have a limited amount of capacity. So we need to be really thoughtful about how we use our energy and our capacity, right? So if we are spending a lot of energy being anxious around money or like having these limiting beliefs or unconscious beliefs that we don't consent to, if that's taking up our mental space, our emotional space, then like we're not making room for the other stuff, the good stuff. When I went to nutrition school, they always used to talk about crowding crowding out. Instead of cutting out, we want to crowd things out. So we want to crowd our plate with like veggies and I don't know, proteins and like healthy shit. And so that there's less room on the plate for like mashed potatoes and Skittles because, but we're not just like, oh, I'm not going to eat. We're just crowding out the bad stuff and we're putting in better stuff or stuff that serves us more. So that's what we're going to talk about today is uncluttering and like sort of like spring cleaning the beliefs and systems that just aren't working for us anymore so that we can fill up our brains and our unconscious and our conscious and our habits around money with good stuff that serves us. So let's talk about money's vibe. (laughs) So money has a couple of vibes. Money's first vibe is I amplify. Money amplifies what's already there. Money doesn't create something new. Money doesn't necessarily change us, really. It doesn't. It just amplifies what's already there. It's very Jupiterian. So for better or worse, What's already in you, what's, what you're already about, what you already believe is going to be amplified when you have more money. You're not going to change. You're not going to become a smarter or better person. You're not going to become an evil person if you have money, if you're not already an evil person. And let's be honest, all of us have elements of like evil genius, right? Or like sort of like shadowy, nasty elements that we're not so proud of, of like our jealous, the jealous person or the bully. I don't know, name some other horrible archetypes that we're all scared to be, but we shouldn't be because they all kind of serve us. A bitch, stingy, right? Whatever is already there, money is going to blow up and amplify. So I know for me, I was really worried that if I made money, I'd be evil right? Because we have been taught for so long that money is the root of all evil. That's a popular saying. Like, we all hate Jeff Bezos, right? We all hate people with money. It's so easy to say that evil people, money, people who have money are evil people. And to just create that equal sign, right? Of Well, the money by the transitive power must be evil. When in fact, that's not actually true. Money just amplifies what's already there. And the vast majority of people don't do any self-work in order to make money. They just don't, right? And the vast amount of people and corporations, we'll talk about corporations and the phases that they go through, but they start out with good intentions, but then they don't do any work on themselves to work on their shadow and their shadow eventually overtakes them, right? And that's where we see like evil and unethical and like uh, cheating and just the horrible stuff that we see when people accumulate so much wealth, right? And that's not actually the case. So this might be a a belief that you want to sort of like deposit into your unconscious bank of money just amplifies what's already there. So that's good news for you if you're sitting in this class because you're already doing the work to clear the aspects of yourself. First off, you're not evil, right? You're not, no one's net evil. We all have elements of goodness to us. And second, you're already doing the work on yourself to be as conscious as possible and not let your shadow run you and your actions. So as long as you're doing that work, you don't need to worry about becoming someone that you don't want to be when you have more money. Money amplifies what's already there. So if you work on becoming the fullest, clearest version of yourself, money will amplify that. Money's next vibe is I'm powerful. Money is fucking powerful. It's really powerful. And it makes people who have it more powerful. And guess what? If we have a limiting belief or we have fear around holding power because we're scared of what will happen if we have it, because we don't know if we can be trusted if we have it, then we're unconsciously going to push away holding money, right? Having money, obtaining wealth. Does anyone have a fear of power? I'm sure that like I certainly do as a white woman. Like, no, I can't be trusted with power. We fuck it up, (laughs) right? So what's the response here? Like, how can we work around this? Or at least how can we acknowledge it? First off, money is powerful. And money offers more people who have it more power. Now, 
that doesn't mean that we should be worried about holding it, especially, again, if we're doing the work on ourselves unconsciously to be incredible leaders, to be equitable leaders, to be inclusive leaders, to be empathetic leaders, right? So if you are someone who's ethical and moral and empathic and intuitive, aren't you exactly the type of person who should have more power in this world, right? To do something better because money is just a tool to help us achieve a purpose. It's not the purpose. So money can help us obtain power and use that power for good. The next thing money's vibe is money makes people money says like I make people feel things and there are so many different ideas around what money is some people say that money is like completely a neutral energy some people say that money is an evil energy other people say that money is a spirit or an entity and whatever like school of thought you subscribe to great I tend to believe that money is an entity. I don't believe it's like a spirit, like a god or a goddess. I believe it has an energy and an entity in and of itself. And I believe that because I'm a person, I tend to personify money, just like I tend to personify Jupiter or or Saturn, right? It's like I give them human emotions and feelings. And Whatever works for you, great, but let's address that like money is not just neutral energy. Money is so much more than that. For so many people, money is traumatic and it is distressing and it has a huge emotional amount of emotional baggage to it. So for anyone to say that money is just energy is actually like super gaslighting, in my opinion, and incorrect. So you can disagree with me. That's totally fine. But I just don't find that helpful to say money is just neutral. Money's neutral energy. Money's neutral energy. It's just, or it's just energy. I just don't agree with that personally because it is so, it was so much more than that to me. And just saying it's just energy, I felt like I was gaslighting myself all the time. I'm like, why can't I get over this? It's just energy. What's wrong with me? Why can't I fix this? It's just energy. Like if I'm so good at energy shit, then how come like I can't figure this out? And to me, that's because it's not. And So that gets us into money's vibe. I make people feel things. Money is not just neutral, right? If it was neutral, then it wouldn't make people feel anything. If it was, it's not. (laughs) It's a mirror many times, but that's still not neutral. Money makes people feel big, big, big emotions, big feelings. And if we are to hold money, if we are to obtain wealth, and by the transitive property, we will also make people feel feel big things, right? We will make people feel envious. We will make people feel jealous. We will make people feel resentful. But we're not making them feel that way. That's not our responsibility, right? That is completely the responsibility of the person who is perceiving us. So the best thing that we can do is acknowledge that money makes people feel things. And if we have wealth, if we have money, people are going to feel a certain way about us sometimes. And that is out of our control. It is not our responsibility, nor is it our business, how other people perceive us. As long as we're being aligned and right within ourselves, and we know and we're being like as clear as possible on who we are and acting in integrity with ourselves, that's all we can do. And then money's final vibe that I want to talk about today, because there's so much more we could talk about, is I create and destroy. So the, like, this is life. Life is creation and destruction. Life is life and death, always next to each other, constantly. Death is always promised, as Ethan loves to say. Death is promised for all of us. Death is on the door for all, is at the door for all of us. We just don't want to acknowledge it, right? It's just as close to me as it is to you, as it is to my I don't know, 90 year old great uncle. And it's an inevitable part, inevitable part of life. And it isn't evil and it isn't bad. It's necessary. It's a necessary part of the life cycle. And so if we look at money as sort of like this natural flow, this natural life cycle, we look at wealth, it is about creation and destruction. In order to, for us to get money, to get paid, we're taking it from another. We're consuming it from another, right? It's getting destroyed in someone else's, and someone for somebody else. And we have to be okay with being part of that. 
in order to be okay with money, right? And to be okay making money. And we'll talk about this a little bit later about like the guilt that comes around getting paid, but the creation and destruction process is what money does. And by the way, that's also what humans do, right? That's what artists do. Artists need to destroy something, an idea, in order to create something new. That's what we're doing all day long in our businesses. That's what women do every 28 days in their cycle, right? We're creating and then we're destroying. We're like tearing down. People, Money makes people feel big things, right? And other people's feelings are not our business. What's our business is our work. So that's some of the some of the vibes of money. Honestly, money's kind of dope. Money's chill. Like money's like I'm an amplifier. Also, I'm like totally powerful. I make people feel things. I'm totally a Pisces, and I create and destroy. Like I'm such a Scorpio, Leo, like Gemini vibe. You know, money is pretty cool. I think, and we project a lot of shit onto money, right? That it maybe doesn't necessarily need to own. It's super powerful, and anything that's super powerful is going to be wielded sometimes for evil and sometimes for good. And is it that thing's responsibility? I, 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 DK. I don't know. But I think of money as this like sort of energy, sort of maybe this person or this identity. And that helps me in my relationship to money of like, well, there's good and, and bad to all things and all people. No one is pure evil. No one is purely good. And um, it's situational. So let's talk about some money myths. So the first money myth that I want to debunk is that work can't be fun. That's a lie. Work can totally be fun. Did anyone think that they were going to come and learn about Karl Marx today? Because I was really excited to throw this into my slideshow. So Karl Marx, my homie, argued that people self-actualize through work. But work is actually super, super important for us to, like, become who we are. And he defined work as humans purposefully reshaping the natural world and extending the possibilities of human life. How fucking cool is that, right? Like work is not just like drudgery. It's creating new realms of possibility. It is extending what humans can touch and make and create. But Capitalism ruins the party again. Uh, capitalism has reshaped our communities to privilege money over leisure time. And because we relate money to work, right, if, because we because of capitalism, if I work more, I'll make more money, then work has effectively colonized the most meaningful aspects of our lives, right? Time with our family, time to think and make mistakes and expand, right? Work should be this thing that helps us become more human, but instead it's become this robotic element of our lives that's actually completely devoid of our humanity, and it doesn't need to be that. No wonder work fucking sucks for so many people. By being intentional about our lives, we are rewarded with social and environmental connections that are more valuable than money or consumer goods. And when we have that relationship to our work, Wealth comes with it. Remember, the definition of wealth is well-being and health, right? I have a works cited with like, I think like nine books. I'm going to ask you guys to take a look at if you want to dive deeper on this. So that's coming for you. Okay, second myth that I want to talk about is you don't have to work hard to earn money. You don't have to work hard to earn money. Does anyone have this belief that they have to work really, really hard in order to make more? I definitely had it. I remember when I was consulting, I was like, waking up at like 5, 4, 30, 5 a.m. to like work on holisticism. And then I'd go work at my like desk job from nine to five or whatever, like on my consulting job. And then I'd like come back and I'd work more. And I had this thought in my mind of like, well, every hour that I work, I can bill for. So like I every hour that I'm awake, I effectively should be billing because like <laughs> I'm awake. So I should be earning money. And I thought that I just was like, how the fuck am I ever going to like, how do people live? How do people go to the grocery store or like to the doctor? I just didn't understand it. How is that possible? I thought that I had to always like work more hours or work harder in order to make more. And that's actually not true at all. That's actually super, super not true. In fact, like the wealthiest people, while they work, they don't work they're not like slaving away at their computers all day. In fact, far from it most of the time. Like their work is more chilling out and giving people advice. <laughs> it's less like, you know, pounding on their keyboards. Some people have guilt, I've noticed, over the idea of earning passive income because it feels too easy. 
or maybe for you, it might be something like coaching where you're like, oh, I can't charge $500 an hour for coaching because it's like too easy. I just sit there and I like show up and tell them information like it's got to be I have to like work harder than that. And that's, that's not actually true. Your work can be very easy. What people, people aren't paying for difficulty. People are paying for your expertise and your opinion. And your opinion doesn't have to be like a uh, hard one. Also just by you living, you're like, <laughs> and getting experience, you're creating more value. And guess what? The more living that you do outside of your computer and outside of like studying and like hard work, the more like real life experience you have, the more actually valuable you will likely be to your customers and clients. You don't get paid for your time. You get paid for your impact perspective shift. I love the Pablo Picasso. I'm sure many of you have heard of this, the, the anecdote that a woman found, saw Pablo Picasso in a cafe and she was like, oh, sketch me, sketch me on this napkin. And he was like, okay, bitch. And then he did. He sketched her. It took like, you know, two seconds. He probably drew like a little square and then like an eyeball. And he was like, that's $5,000 or $30,000. And she was like, it took you three minutes. What do you mean? Like you just, you like hammered it down on the back of a napkin. He was like, you're not paying for the three minutes. You're paying for the 30 years of my life that was spent developing the skills to, to make this for you. And so that's, that's it, right? That's it. That's what it's about. So my next money myth that I want to talk about is that you can be nice and take, still make a shit ton of money. And this one is, I have three slides on this because this is a really hard myth, especially for female people who hold a female identity. It was a really hard one for us. So you can be nice and still make a shit ton of money. You can. It's possible. Where did we learn this idea that we had to be bitches or like assholes in order to make money? If you think about how the archetype of a female boss comes up in media, it's always like Miranda Priestly, right? She's making, she's fucking baller moves. Like, did you see her apartment in New York? It has three staircases. I didn't even have a, a door that locked when I lived in New York. She's making spooky cash, but she's the worst, right? Like her family hates her. Everyone hates her. She's miserable. She looks amazing. But other than that, she, her life sucks. And then if you think about the bosses, the like kind bosses that we see in media, even like Snow White would be a good example of like a kind boss in a way, right? Like she's like nice to the door. She's like, oh yeah, if you could do that, that'd be great. But like Kristen Wiig in Bridesmaids, remember she was like cool and nice and she had a cupcake shop and the cupcake shop went under. We learned that if you're like feminine and nice, then you go broke, that you can't be a good boss. You can't be successful. I learned from, I've only had, until I worked at like my second startup, I'd only had female bosses and they were so mean. They were so mean. They were so misogynistic. God, it was the worst. I fucking hated them. And I didn't want to be a boss specifically for that reason. I feel like I didn't hire people purposely for a really long time because I was scared of perpetuating that idea of being a bitch. So this is not just like a media thing. This is also something that we can unconsciously perpetuate because of internalized misogyny because of capitalism, often because capitalism tells us that there can only be one in the room, right? There can only be one person of a marginalized identity. There can only be one woman. There can only be one person of color, whatever it might be. There can only be one queer person. And so like we have to sort of elbow people out of the way in order to be the one, to be the, the pick me person. So these are things that come up there. It's all connected, right? So let's talk about like good versus bad or nice. Let's maybe you're like, well, there no corporations are good. No corporations are nice. And that's not actually true. Corporations aren't inherently good or evil. They just go through different phases. This is from a really great book called Purpose Over Profit. Uh, it's a great book. And uh, this author has looked at hundreds of corporations and organizations and how sort of mapped how they evolved. And basically, most corporations start with the honest era, right, where they're starting to make a difference, to, to have a purpose, to reshape the world for the better. And then they eventually slide into the deceptive area where they're hiding elements and aspects of themselves. If we think about this, this is like when we're not acknowledging our shadow, right? When we're not acknowledging our shadow, we try to hide it away from the world, try to like smush it in the basement. And eventually it comes out, right? And when it comes out, we have to apologize for it and our bad behavior. And that's what happens in corporations. They go through this cycle of an honest area, a deceptive era, and then they get found out, an apologetic era, and then it starts over. They try to go back and be, be honest, but often they backslide. So how do we stay honest in the world as, as founders and creators? We have to prioritize human beings and people. 
right? Over profits. The book is people over profits. There we go. Okay, so we have to prioritize people. First and foremost, prioritize your employees. You're an employee of your business, so you need to prioritize yourself. Second, you want to prioritize your customers and the people that you're that you're working. Those are effectively the people you're working for. Third, you want to prioritize your vendors. Vendors are the people that work with you, and they're in, in many ways the the face of your business to others. They're ambassadors of your business. So we want to prioritize people in that order. People who work with us first, then our customers and clients, then our vendors. And then in order to stay in this honest era, we need to be honest. Right? The truth matters. We have to be transparent. We have to be authentic. And we have to be generous. And I'm sharing this with you around the idea that people can be nice and make a shit ton of money because no company has been either totally evil, born totally evil or totally good and stayed that way forever. Same thing with people. We are not born innately good or innately bad and we don't stay. We aren't fixed. We are constantly evolving and changing and we can choose to evolve and change whenever we want. Right? So Companies can be good and choose to be good and choose to be kind and still make a shit ton of money. It's completely possible. And it's okay if people don't like you. You can be kind and people will still won't like you. Trust me. I know. You can be like try to be the best version of yourself and people are still going to be like, you fucking suck. And there's nothing you can do about it. They're going to find a reason not to like you. They're going to be like, she's too nice. You know what? That bitch, she's too nice. (laughs) She's too happy. She's too helpful, right? They're always going to find a reason not to like you if they are set to not like you. And there's nothing we can do about it other than be okay with ourselves and know that the only thing that's our responsibility is to do us, right? Is to be impeccable with our own word, to be like super aligned within ourselves, to be in integrity within ourselves and to know our own character so that when our character gets called into question, even if we tend to be people pleasers, which I definitely tend to be, and that might cause a moment of like, is that true what that person's saying about me? We know deep down who we are. We know that we are innately good. We know that we are innately valuable. And that's all that matters. I mean, I could talk about this forever, so I don't really want to go off on a tangent about it right now, but women need to be liked in order not to be murdered. <laughs> like, so, like, right? We need to be accepted in order to not be, like, burned at the stake. And usually that means accommodating others' feelings. And that's a really old, 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 old set of programming for us. So money amplifies what's already there. It doesn't fix problems. Fixing our money, addressing our money beliefs can, though, because, again, money is a dimension of well-being, right? So, like, our belief systems around money, what we're, what we're um, projecting onto it probably address can be addressed in another area of our lives, maybe in, like, our relationships or our relationship to ourselves, how we see ourselves, right? So much more than just money. So let's go back to that idea of breathless fear and excitement. It takes up so much space, right? We talked about how that takes up space. Inevitably, we're going to fill up this space. So let's fill it up with stuff that serves us and stuff that we actually consent to, as opposed to ideas that were planted in our subconscious or in our consciousness that we didn't consent to, that we weren't like, yeah, mom, please, 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 please. I would love to always fear money. (laughs) Because you have a fucked up relationship to it. Yeah, that sounds great. No, I didn't opt into that. I didn't like put my email address in and then click sign me up. No, I didn't. No, I didn't add to cart. So I'm not, I'm giving those things back because they're not mine. And I'm going to create, clear out that space and fill in that space with something that actually I consent to, that I actually believe in and that I actually want to see in my life. So a major way of uncluttering is forgiving ourselves and others who have wronged us in the past around money. And I'm going to give you a bunch of journal prompts in a couple slides, but also in a notion document that I'm giving you at the end of this class. And this is a huge aspect of being okay with money is first we need to forgive ourselves for all the mistakes that we've made around money. Because if we have shame around what we've done in the past, that's wrong. We're never going to be able to move forward. We have to be okay with like, saying, yeah, I can't believe I got into $30,000 worth of credit card debt. I can't believe I was so stupid. And I forgive myself for not knowing better. 
because no one told me, no one taught me that. And I can't stay mad at myself because staying mad at yourself is just taking up more space, right? We have a limited amount of energy. Staying mad at yourself, like, that takes up so much space in your mind. I think about all the time, like, when I had disordered eating and how much space that took up in my brain of counting calories and hating myself and hating my body and how many other amazing things I could have been doing with that energy. (laughs) And, like, thank God my brain doesn't drift over in that direction anymore i'm able to do so much more that serves me and serves the people around me as opposed to just being like all up in here and we also have to not just forgive ourselves which is so important but we need to forgive the people who have wronged us around money so have you ever had a boss that didn't pay you enough who like you know didn't pay you enough you ever had someone who like never paid you back have you ever had someone who was taking advantage of you? Have you ever had a client that that took your course and then, you know, sent that didn't pay their credit card, so swindled you out of getting paid for what you did? You have to forgive those people too. Does anyone have an example of like a boss? Does anyone have a boss that they need to forgive? Just pop into the chat. I have a boss I need to forgive. I needed to forgive like big time. I had a couple bosses I needed to forgive for not paying me my worth. And also seeing that, like, in some ways, that wasn't always their fault directly, that there was other stuff at play. Mm -hmm. So that's part of this. And you might not forgive them at first, but I would recommend writing in your journal or taking a moment for, like, five minutes daily for the next week or however long it takes you to really feel like, you know what, I forgive this person and I don't need this in my, I don't need this space anymore. I don't need this in my brain. Like, I don't need to hold on to this emotion anymore. It's just not working for me. I notice that this comes up around, this is so much easier with, like, exes. (laughs) It's easier to do because we want love, actually, like, a lot more than we want money. And it's so much easier to move on when you forgive an ex, right? When you're like, you are a piece of absolute shit that I, like, don't want to be mad at you anymore because it's exhausting. And I just want to be in love with the person I'm with. Because, like, this is really all that matters to me. So if it's hard for you to forgive someone who's done you wrong in terms of money, it might be helpful to channel that feeling around forgiving an old partner or someone who's done you wrong now that you're happy or in love or you've moved on. And then the next thing that we want to unclutter is just what patterns do you have around money right now that take up space? And do you like them? I'll give you some examples that I have around money. All right. That's our episode. Thanks so much for listening. We love being in your ear holes. And just as a reminder, we are doing a giveaway for the month of June. If you subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, you will be entered to win a little holistic business bag bag. It is super cute. You get some stickers. They're holographic. You can put them on your computer or your planner or I don't know, your face, anywhere you really want, your phone. And you get a cute little keychain that says very witchy, which will let everyone know that you are a magical witch not to be fucked with. It's adorable. And I'd love to send it to you. So make sure that you subscribe, rate, and review the podcast and send us evidence of your rating and you'll be entered to win. May the luckiest witch win. All right, we'll see you next week. Bye. (music) 